good day class so this is already the last of the separation processes and this is about membranes processing so when we speak of membrane processing this concerns the different separation methods for homogeneous and heterogeneous fluid mixtures so fluid meaning it could be a liquid or a gas now, when we define membrane separation processes, these are processes in which separation is due to either the difference in solubilities and diffusion rates through a membrane. So there is this requirement of the presence of the membrane and the difference in the solubilities or the differences in the solubilities uh, enable the components of the mixture, the original mixture, which is our feed to be separated. So I will discuss this in details later on when we go to membranes and the different uh, terms related to uh, separation processes such as the permeate. But nonetheless, you could see here that the membrane uh, separated the blue uh, balls, which is the solvent from the uh, solute particles but there is a shall we say a not 100 percent separation because there are still solid particles on the other side that's primarily has something to do with diffusion rates and the differences in the solubility or the affinity of the solid particle to the particular membrane now, the feed consisting of a mixture here of two or more components is partially separated. Partially, so as you could see, it's partial. It's not 100% separation because you could still see the two components of the original feed on the other side, uh, which pass through the membrane. Partial separation of the components of a feed which may consist of several components by means of a semi-permeable membrane we call a barrier which is the membrane through which some species move faster than the other so that has something to do with uh, diffusion rates now in membrane separation the two products are usually miscible so the separating agent is a semi-permeable barrier or membrane and a sharp, a sharp separation is often difficult to achieve and as such, the term partial separation only because there's no 100% separation between the components. The feed mixture is composed of the retentate and the permeate, the original mixture that needs to pass through the membrane. So if you recall in the illustration that was shown to you a while ago, uh, in the discussion of membrane separation processes, the, those that were allowed by the membrane to pass through is the permeate. The remaining uh, solution on the other side, which were not allowed to pass through, or in terms of diffusion rate, has a slower rate of passing through the membrane, is the retentate. So from the term retention, it was not allowed by the uh, membrane to pass through. So part of the feed that does not pass through the membrane the part of the feed that passes through the membrane, referring to the retentate and the permeate respectively. Now, what are the very important driving forces or driving force that uh, allows the separation? So pressure in the case of a gas or vapor is the driving force, the difference in pressure. And in the case of the liquid, it's the difference in concentration. Difference in partial pressure and concentration across the membrane are usually created by imposing or by the imposition of a pressure differential across the membrane. So the driving force for liquid separation can also be created by the use of a solvent on the permeate side. So there is a solvent that is uh, poured on the permeate side of the membrane to create a concentration difference. Or it could be done uh, by an electric field when the solute is ionic. So it could be done through the use of an electric field. But that's in the cases, the special case in which the solute is ionic. Now, when we speak of membranes, these are materials. So a layer of material that serves as a selective barrier between two phases, 
and remains impermeable to specific particles. So selective, uh, the membrane is selective as to what particles it will allow to pass through. Uh, molecules or substances when exposed to the action of the driving force. So the, those that were allowed to pass through, the particles that were allowed to pass through are the permeate. Those that were just, that were not allowed to pass through are the retentate. So this is an example of a cross flow membrane because the separation uh, direction is perpendicular to the direction of the flow. <clears throat> So when we speak of membranes, they can be classified as isotropic membranes or anisotropic membranes. And you have the examples here. And in the succeeding slides, we will be discussing each of these. So the proper choice of a membrane should be determined by the specific application. So which particular membrane should be utilized for a particular separation depends on the objective. So it could be the particle or dissolved solids removal. It could be the hardness reduction in the case of ultra pure water production, or it could be the removal of specific gases or chemicals. So removal of solids, removal of gases, or this one is very specific, a hardness reduction in the case of ultra pure water uh, production. Now, what's the membrane's function? So it will act as a semi-permeable barrier between the two phases. It creates separation by controlling the rate of movement of species across the membrane, having to do with rate of diffusion. And separation can involve two phases, the vapor, two gas phases, and two liquid phases, or it could be a vapor and a liquid phase. So only fluids are involved in membrane separation. Characteristics of membranes. So these are thin, non-porous polymeric fil film, but may also be porous polymer, ceramic, or metal material. Or it could even be, take note, your membrane could even be a liquid, a gel, or a gas. The membrane must never dissolve, disintegrate, or break in the process of separation. So it's supposed to be the one that will separate the components. So it should not dissolve, disintegrate, or break. There is this what we call optional sweep. So it's a term that is referred to the liquid or gas used to facilitate the removal of the permeate. So in aid of the uh, separation membrane, uh, sometimes there is this particular sweep that is being used. Membrane requirement for effective separation. So for effective separation, a membrane must poss possess high permeance and a high permeance ratio for the two species being separated. So in terms of the membrane requirements, it should have high permeance. In terms of the two species to be separated, they have to have high permeance ratio. Now, if we will categorize the broad the membrane of the membrane materials, the two categories that is, we have the microporous membranes or the non-porous dense membranes. So the microporous membranes are characterized by interconnected pores, which are small, but large in comparison to the size of the small molecules. Now, as for the non-porous dense membrane, separation occurs by components in a gas or liquid feed diffusing to take note the surface of the membrane. Then after diffusing to the surface of the membrane, it gets dissolved into the membrane material. Then after getting dissolved on the membrane material, it will diffuse to the solid and then desorbed at the downstream interface. So there are four things that are happening for non-porous dense membrane. So your feed will be diffusing to the surface of the membrane, then it will dissolve in the membrane material, then this diffuse again through the solid that is the membrane and desorb at the downstream interface. So diffuse, dissolve, diffuse, and desorb. So these are the four things that are happening for non-porous dense 
membranes. So let's look into the types of membranes that are usually being used as categorized whether porous or non-porous. So we'll go to the microporous membrane. So this membrane behaves almost like a fiber filter and separates by a sieving mechanism determined by the pore diameter and particle size. So the pores in the, the membrane may vary between non, one nanometer to 20 microns. So that's your microporous membrane. For the asymmetric membrane, so this comprises a very thin, so 0.1 to 1 micron only skin layer on a highly porous 100 to 200 micron thick substructure. Its separation characteristics are determined by the nature of the membrane material or pore size. And take note, the mass transport rate is determined mainly by the thickness of this particular membrane. So as to the amount of material that was allowed to pass through, it will be dependent on how thick this asymmetric membrane is. As for electrically charged membranes, these are ion exchange membranes consisting of highly swollen gels carrying fixed positive or negative charges. So these membranes are used in the process of electrodialysis. Then we have liquid membranes. So a liquid membrane utilizes a carrier to selectively transport components such as metal ions at relatively high rate across the membrane interface. So if you recall our discussion about the term sweep, so this particular uh, carrier could be likened to a sweep. In aid of the membrane, it allows the permeate to pass through at a much higher rate through the barrier, which is our membrane itself. So the last type of membrane is the homogeneous membrane. Let me check. So the homogeneous membrane. Okay, this is our homogeneous membrane. It was not linked properly, sorry. So this is a dense film to which a mixture of molecules is transported by. So the, the transportation of molecules is through pressure, concentration, or electrical potential gradient. So it could be any of these three that could be a driving force for the separation of a component from the rest of the components of your feed in your membrane. Now we go to the common membrane separation processes. So what are these common membrane separation processes? So the most common is reverse osmosis, a process by which a solvent passes through a porous membrane in the direction opposite to that for natural osmosis. So when subjected to a hydrostatic pressure greater than the osmotic pressure. pressure. So the thing is the it should have been the osmotic pressure that should uh, push the components separation. But in this case, the direction is not as the natural osmotic direction, but rather the opposite. So the pressure gradient needed here would be from 10 to 50 bars and can be even up to 100 bars. So take note, it's the term reverse osmosis. So the expected direction is opposite or opposite to that of the natural osmotic direction. Now to illustrate uh, the thing with reverse osmosis, in order to equalize, to equalize the concentration of this side, uh, of these two sides with the membrane here in between, the direction of flow should have been, if this is concentrated and this is less concentrated, the direction of flow would have been in, in this manner, left to the left. But in the case of reverse osmosis, due to the applied pressure, the direction is to the right. Okay, but it would be clearer, clearly uh, illustrated by the means of the video that I will be sharing with you. And I'll be sharing videos in all of the common separation processes, by the way, that are discussed in here to complement my discussion on the said uh, membrane separation. Okay, so please uh, check on this, listen to this video.
Okay, so that's our reverse osmosis. I think it's much even clearer now with the video. So the osmotic pressures that allows for the natural osmotic direction is given or is actually derived from the natural uh, ideal gas equation or the ideal gas equation and that's PV equal to NRT. So experimental data show that osmotic pressure of a solution is proportional to the concentration of the solute and the temperature. So it's dependent on the concentration. So N over V is the concentration here. V sub M is the volume of the mixture. N is the number of moles of solute and T is the temperature. So the N and the T here are the two determining factors in which P or pi in this case the osmotic pressure is dependent on. So you will never forget this particular formula because it's just coming from the ideal gas law, the osmotic pressure of solutions. So what are the applications of reverse osmosis? So these are just but some of the many. So desalination of brackish water to remove salt from brackish water, treatment of wastewater to remove a wide variety of impurities, treatment of surface and groundwater, concentration of foodstuffs, removal of alcohol from beer that could be done through reverse osmosis, clarification of fruit juice, removal of bacteria from foodstuffs. Okay, just some of the many. The next is electrodialysis. So this particular membrane process is used to transport salt ions from one solution through ion exchange membranes to another solution under the influence of an applied electric potential difference. So it's the ions that are being transported and this is done through the use of an applied electric potential difference. So let's say for example, you have this feed solution in the case of electrodialysis and these are your membranes. The membranes have, uh, separates the ions present in your feed solution. So they are the one that discriminates the ions that they will let through it pass or pass through it. How is that done through the application of this electric potential difference? So you see this sign for the battery or any electrical source. So those that have already been processed by the membrane are the diluate. So the concentrated parts, the one that has the ions separated from the, shall I say, the diluted feed solution already are what we call the concentrate. So diluate, concentrate. You have the feed solution here and you have the electric potential difference being applied here. Uh, this would be also, again, uh, complemented by this discussion through a video. The case or in the case of our um, <clears throat> discussion a while ago that separates the concentrate from the diluate. <clears throat> Application of electrodialysis, so production of table salt from seawater, concentration of brines from reverse osmosis, treatment of wastewaters from electroplating. So the ions or the metal ions are separated from the clear water demineralization of cheese whey and production of ultra pure water for the semiconductor industry. This is done by electrodialysis. Then we go to dialysis or we call it liquid permeation. The separation of particles in a liquid on the basis of difference in their ability to pass through a membrane. So it's this time, it's the liquid particles that are being separated. So small solutes in, a li in one liquid phase diffuse readily because of the concentration difference to a porous membrane to the second liquid or vapor phase. So passage of large molecules to the membrane is rather more difficult. Now, 
in dialysis, we have the term dialysate and diffusate. So the solvent is the diffusate, the dialysate is the feed solution. Or simply put, the one that is being processed is the dialysate. This one is the being is the one that is being processed. The one that is being used to allow the small solutes to pass through, but the big molecules remaining is the diffusate. So we use this particular material, the solvent. The solvent, the diffusate, the dialysate is the one that is being processed. So in terms of an illustration, dialysis would be something like this. So there's a solution here, which only allows the smaller uh, particles to diffuse through. The larger particles remains, okay? So I will illustrate it here to the dialysis that is commonly happening for people who have a liver or a kidney failure rather. So please listen to this. Okay, so that's dialysis applied to the process of cleaning our blood with waste materials that our sick kidneys cannot anymore take or remove. Now we go to the application. So in terms of its industrial application, it can be applied to the separation of nickel sulfate from sulfuric acid. 
what you just saw is hemodialysis, removal of waste metabolites and excess body water and restoration of electrical bal electrolyte rather balance in the blood. So that's done to the process of hemodialysis. So hemoglobin for the blood dialysis for the separation. Now let's discriminate between the three membrane separations that we have discussed already. Okay, so that's how we differentiate the process of separation by diffusion, osmosis, reverse osmosis, and dialysis. So actually, you don't see reverse osmosis there, but if you already learned osmosis, then the reverse of that would be reverse osmosis. Okay, so we go to pervaporation, so a process method for um, the separation of mixtures of liquids by partial vaporization as the term pervaporation, partial vaporization through a porous or non-porous membrane. So the process is restricted or should be occurring below 100 degrees separation, uh, 100 degrees Celsius. So pervaporation, actually it's permeation and evaporation. So let's just move on. So pervaporation is permeation plus evaporation. So dense membrane process, which can be used for selective separation of solvents based on selective sorption and this diffusion of one of the components to the membrane. Now, this is a technique whereby the components of a mixture of two liquids are separated by selective permeation. So you have permeation here through a semi-permeable membrane the component that passes to the membrane further being removed by evaporation. And as such, the term pervaporation. It's the two terms permeation and evaporation connected together. Application is the dehydration of ethanol water astrotrope. So take note, these two ethanol water can reach a certain temperature in which they'll be astrotropic. So process of separating would be by uh, pervaporation. Removal of water from organic solvents can also use pervaporation and removal of organics from water. Now let's go to microfiltration. This is a low pressure, pressure difference only of 0.5 to 4 bars cross flow membrane process for separating colloidal and suspended particles in the range of 0 0.05 to 10 microns. So this should be the pressure difference and these are the uh, particle size that could be uh, that is suspended in our colloidal mixture and can be separated from it. The flow should be cross flow. The pressure driven flow through the membrane separates micron sized particles from fluids which are larger than those in ultra filtration. This is used in separation of heterogeneous mixtures. Now, see, this is microfiltration. So you have this microfiltration membrane, and through the application of pressure, the smaller particles are separated from the bigger particles. So microfiltration. 
Now, the techniques used in microfiltration could be the dend end filtration, something like this, or the cross-flow filtration, which is the commonly used uh, technique. Okay. Now, let's uh, look at this video to complement the discussion on this particular membrane separation process. So that's microfiltration, the separation of smaller particles from bigger particles being utilized in the process of producing ultra pure water uh, used in the uh, homes or even in the industry. So application, separation of bacteria is mentioned, paint pigment yeast cells from solutions, sterilization of liquids, gases, and parenteral drugs. Uh, we also have clarification and biological stabilization of beverages, bacterial cell harvest and purification of antibiotics, and recovery of mammalian cells from cell culture broth. So as you could see, uh, it's really being used something to do with the uh, bacterial harvest or purification in shall I say, very uh, crucial processing like production of beverages that has to be using clear and biologically safe water or stabilized water and the drugs, the production of drugs. So very important is the process of microfiltration. Ultra, so if we have microfiltration, what is ultrafiltration? So this uh, process uh, uses pressure to obtain a separation of molecules by a semi-permeable polymeric membrane. Take note, it's polymeric. The membrane discriminates on the basis of molecular size, just like microfiltration. It could also discriminate to shape or chemical structure and separates relatively high molecular weight solutes such as proteins, polymers, and colloidal materials such as minerals. A pressure-driven process similar to reverse osmosis using asymmetric membranes, but that are significantly more porous than the one that is being used in reverse osmosis. So this is ultrafiltration, and we listen to the video.
Okay, that's ultra filtration specifically and uh, comprehensively discussed in the processing of water. Okay, so one of the many application is pre-concentration of milk before uh, making it into uh, or making it in the production of cheese, clarification of fruit juices, purification of recombinant proteins and DNAs, antigens and antibiotics from clarified cell broth, and color removal from craft black liquor in paper making. So these are the applications of ultrafiltration processes. Now, if we will discriminate again in comparison, microfiltration from ultrafiltration and nanofiltration and reverse osmosis in terms of the sizes of particles that are allowed by the membrane to pass through. So if we are to process water, uh, pure water or ultra pure water, then this would be the processing. We start with microfiltration with these sizes being separated, ultrafiltration even uh, separating smaller particles than the microfiltration process. The nanofiltration even separating even the smallest particles here. And then reverse osmosis takes care of the final processing of the permeate, which is our potable water or the water that is being used in the production of, shall I say, medicines or uh, in biological processes. Gas permeation, so uses a dense polymer membrane, which is non-porous, such as rubber or polyamide. The solute gas dissolves first in the membrane and then diffuses in the solid to the other gas phase. The, the feed here is at high pressure and usually contains some low molecular mass species, typically less than 50 kilogram per kilogram mole, to be separ separated from higher molecular mass species. The, the range of the pressure gradient is from 20 to 40 bars. So it uses a dense polymeric membrane. So this is in the case of gas permeation. And this is how it is. So you have here the AB feed mixture, the gas mixture, and you have this particular membrane here. And there's an application of a uh, pressure difference. So this, is, this part is at low pressure. So what happens, the A-rich retentate passes here whereas the B-rich permeate passes in this side. So the A then particles are separated from the B particles uh, through cross flow uh, separation in our membrane. So separation of the two uh, particles in terms of their sizes. Now we have here the, the application of gas permeation. So separation of carbon dioxide from hydrogen or hydrogen from methane or separation of uranium isotopes, adjustments of the hydrogen carbon monoxide ratio in a synthesis gas, separation of air into nitrogen and oxygen in which streams, recovery of helium from natural gas using a fluorocarbon polymer and recovery of methane from biogas, so just one, I think, of the many applications of gas permeation. Now we go to gas diffusion in a porous solid. So a microporous solid membrane, in this case, separates the two gas phases present in both sides of the membrane. The rates of molecular diffusion of the various gas molecules depend on the pore size and the molecular weights of the molecules. Separation of gaseous components here is achieved using the selective property of the membrane so or the affinity of the solid particle to the membrane that was being used. When the pores are much smaller than the mean free path in the gas phase, uh, about 1000 angstrom at standard condition, the gases diffuse through the membrane independently by what we call as the Nadsen diffusion equation. And this was also discussed in our topic in diffusion in heat and mass transfer. So this is how the diffusion of your gas molecules to the membrane. So you have here the feed, you have the application of the differential pressure here, and you have the permeate passing through in here. So this is not some diffusion. This is what is happening in the process of a simple uh, molecular sieving. And this is in the processing of solution diffusion, okay? 
diffusion in the sense that smaller particles are diffusing uh, through this particular membrane. So the, bar, uh, the bigger molecules are being retained on the other side. So these are the different ways of how glass molecules diffuses through something, the membranes, the something that is porous. Now application of gaseous diffusion in porous membranes. So it's in use in the production of enriched uranium by forcing gaseous uranium hexafluoride or the CUF6 to semi-permeable membranes. Now the mean free path that was mentioned there that is related to the pore size is the average distance a gas molecule travels before it collides with another gas molecule. Now its formula what was actually I think uh, discussed already in your chem one, the mean free path. So your uh, variables that appear in the equation, the mean uh, free path is defined in here. It's in meters. The mu is the viscosity in pascal second. The P is the pressure in pascal. So T is the temperature in Kelvin. It has to be absolute. M is the molecular weight of our molecule. And the R is the universal gas constant. So this is the um, formula that we used in computing to the average distance a particular mole travels before, molecule rather travels before it collides with another molecule in a gas. So this is only for gases. Now, if we will determine the diffusivity that's represented by D sub K A having the units meter squared per second, so this will be our formula. It's dependent on the average pore radius, and this has to be known in meters, and V sub A, which is the average molecular velocity of your uh, molecule A or component A in meters per second. So if we will use the kinetic theory of gases to evaluate this particular average molecular velocity, then the final equation for our diffusivity in meters per second will be 97.4 R bar. R is still the average pore radius multiplied to the square root of the average, or the, the absolute temperature in Kelvin and the molecular weight of the gas molecule. Now let's go to liquid membrane. Now this involves a combination of solvent extraction and stripping processes in a single step. So take note, you have extraction and stripping in a single process in the case of using liquid membranes. So these are your membrane uh, support. And this is the direction in which the feed is flowing through. This is your membrane support, by the way, uh, here and in here. And this is your liquid membrane. Liquid your membrane your, where your feed passes through. So liquid membrane application uh, could be in the recovery of zinc from wastewater in viscous fiber industry and recovery of nickel from electroplating solutions. Now, what are the problems commonly encountered in the membrane separation processes so far that were discussed in this set of slides? So the potential fouling of membrane. So that is why in some of the separation processes here, uh, the membrane that is being used is backwashed because we don't want solids or foreign materials to keep clinging on our membrane as such fouling will occur. And of course, it will also be reducing the mass transfer rate. Now solids present in the liquid feed could also be a problem and a challenge of how to clean the membrane itself. So as it could be used for the next uh, separation processes. Now this is the end of the slide. I will have this uploaded in a while. So hopefully you've learned the commonly used membrane separation processes or commonly encountered membrane separation processes in uh, the industry. Thank you for listening.